So I recently attended a 10-day silent retreat um, called a Vipassana course or retreat. And um, I've had a lot of friends and students ask me to comment on my experience and how it went, what it was like to be silent for so long, um, and what I gained, etc. So um, I'll save the details of the history and tradition of, of Vipassana Buddhist meditation for a, another time, or you can go ahead and look it up on Wikipedia or another um, source on the internet or in books. There's plenty of information on it. Um, so basically, there's many of these centers all over the world, and I went to one in Georgia, in Jessup, Georgia, and you're basically isolated in a retreat center in nature, and you are with um, a large number of meditators. Uh, there were about 50-something um, meditators, uh, participants in this course at the time I went, um, men and women, and the men and women are separated into different living quarters, and you meditate in this in the hall together. Um, and it's actually nine days of silence. The tenth day, you're allowed to talk to other meditators and reintegrate before you go out back into your daily life. So, essentially, these days of silence, this long period, takes the resources that you'd normally allocate towards, the mental resources you'd normally allocate towards socializing and interacting with other people, and it takes that and turns it inward so that you basically have more energy to, instead of reflect between you and others and talk about different things, you can now have an inner dialogue, so to speak. So, um, neuro... Logically speaking, what uh, normally happens is that when you interact with other people, you empathize with them and feel them through the mirror neurons in your brain. The mirror neurons are basically just a name given to the capacity of the majority of neurons in the brain to um, resonate with the activity of what is going on in other living beings. You basically are um, embodying whatever they're feeling neurologically and um, proprioceptively and interoceptively to some degree in your own body, meaning whatever they're going through, whatever they're experiencing, you are mimicking them. You are, in a sense, without doing what they're doing, you can feel them. So this is how we interact. The mirror neuron system is involved in our daily interactions with others. When you are restricting your communication, and in this retreat there was no communication except um, any important logistical questions you had with um, uh, managers there for you, Basically, all that capacity of the mirror neuron system is turned inward. So now you can actually focus on the dialogue between your personal identity and the witnessing awareness. So um, for a while now in my own yogic um, practices and uh, contemplative practices, I've focused on different uh, forms of um, energy work. Uh, different forms of visualizations, different types of meditation, mantras, yantras, etc. Um, and all these are very valuable. And at the same time, those are very different states that one gets in, different frames, if you will. The Vipassana course um, helped me to garner more stability in my meditative awareness, meaning I could hold, uh, have more space more spaciousness and more capacity to hold those different energies and different types of techniques within a larger aware meta awareness that will then allow me to um, let the energies flow, the different techniques be more effective and purify elements of my system more. So my experience uh, was multifaceted. Um, in addition to getting the increased meditative awareness, um, which was really a result of various things. Um, Basically, I experienced peaks and valleys, and many of the peaks were very blissful, where my awareness dissolved into the five elements, earth, water, fire, air, and ether. These, diff these elements are just different sensations and um, different ways of viewing and sensing um, experience. So... My awareness dissolved into some of that, and that was very blissful. And immediately, there was a sensation of craving that, naturally. And then the next day was very um, difficult because I kind of wanted a higher sensation. And instead, I got kind of a dull heaviness, or tamas, as it's known in Sanskrit in yoga terminology. 
So there was a lot of these kind of cycles, ups and downs over the days. And it took me a few days to realize that there is no perfect high and it's not worth chasing because we're constantly changing. In fact, one of the main lessons was that we are change fundamentally on a relative level. And so this technique allowed me to remain more zoomed out in a witnessing perspective so that I was maybe one or more steps removed from what was ex I was experiencing, not in a sort of like aesthetic sort of pushing away of what I'm experiencing, but more of a um, non-clinging, non-pushing um, away. So there's less craving and aversion. In our day-to-day -day experience, we construct our personal identity by selecting preferences that we're attracted to, what we crave, what we have aversion to. And in this experience of meditation over days, it was about 10 hours a day of, of meditation. Wake up at 4 o'clock, go to bed at 9 o'clock, meditate about 9 or 10 hours in one day with some breaks. With all that time, the mind and the brain start to attune to more subtle sensations. And basically, you start scanning your body, which is part of the technique, from top to bottom, bottom to top, part by part, piece by piece. And you stay with areas that have heavier or more um, dull sensations or neutral sensations and you work with it over and over calmly with awareness and equanimity of mind meaning when you feel a sensation there is no like oh i love this or oh i don't like that sensation instead you stay with it stay very present stay aware with whatever you're going through and let it pass and after much scanning the mind attunes to more subtle sensations the radio frequency gets higher, if you will. And the lack of communication with others is an essential um, uh, observance that uh, everyone is required to take, and it's for a very good purpose, a very good scientific purpose. Um, as I explained, your resources go inward. And um, this is many reason, one of the reasons why many people become renunciates or monks or nuns is because they realize that um, a lot of the work of calming the mind and purifying the mind of its many um, identifications and cravings and aversions can be um, much helped by being in solitude for extended periods of time. So essentially, this technique of um, Vipassana was one of direct observations and one of the reservations that many scientists have with spiritual traditions and spiritual techniques is that they think it's all a bunch of hocus pocus. Um, in reality, it's actually a very deep form of science because in scientific observation, typically modern science, you make an injunction, you collect data, and you corroborate what the data is, the results with others to see if it is not just a fluke or a one-time thing, but rather a phenomena, phenomenon that could be observed in, across many experiences, or excuse me, many experiments. Um, meditative science is the same thing. You make an injunction, you dive into your awareness, you collect the data of experience, and then you corroborate that data with others. And again, traditions have been established around this for millennia and centuries. So this is a deep form of science. And the idea is to stay away from the dogma, which uh, this retreat did a fairly good job of. Um, uh, it is a the Pasana technique as taught by... Um, Sri Goenka is basically a, um, it is sectarian in a sense, but it is um, fairly cleansed of certain uh, ideologies in terms of the, uh, the kinds of figures that you might worship in a normal uh, religion. This one is basically um, focusing on what is your own direct experience? Look within, don't visualize anything, don't think about a deity, don't think about a mantra or a yantra or a sound or anything in particular or light. Just pass through your body, observe an experience with your own tool of interoception and proprioception, meaning your capacity, the body's capacity to feel internally and to feel pain and sensations. So um, all in all, it was an incredible experience. And um, I think that uh, I've been to many retreats, man, energy types of retreats. Um, I've been to um, more devotional bhakti forms of retreats. And I would say that uh, all those have their place and everyone has their taste. And at the same time, 
uh, a technique that could be used for everyone for mental health um, and spiritual health, which is a valid dimension of our being. Um, the, these kind of meditation retreats, these 10 days of, of silence and uh, focus helps to actually make the mind stronger and allows you to um, fortify your capacity to stay detached, not in, again, not in a pushing away of your worldly responsibilities, but rather take a break, strengthen your ability to not be attached to things and to crave and pull and really suffer is what all that is. And instead remain aware, let things flow more and uh, establish more peace and equanimity. And there are many scientific studies that demonstrate that these kinds of mindfulness meditations have incredible effects on the brain, lasting changes on the brain um, with enough practice. A beginner will have some changes, an intermediate level practitioner will have um, some more changes, and an advanced practitioner that has more than 10,000 hours of meditation alone will have um, very strong changes in the kind of brain waves that are observed in the brain and can be sustained. So that's pretty much the gist of what I wanted to share and um, we'll cover more in uh, future videos. So good to have you. Thank you so much.